Right now, my game is kind of only getting 1000 FPS, which isn't great. This number could be way better. If I make an empty SDL window, I can get around 10,000 FPS. Wait. When I was testing for this video and I took the average FPS over one second, I got around 2 million FPS. This can't be correct, right? Did I calculate something wrong? That much FPS is a little extreme, but how do I get my game to go back to around 10,000 FPS? Well, one simple method is to delete all the code. But I'm kind of enjoying this project, so I'm not going to do that. Instead, I started looking around the world for how I can improve performance. Then I finally found it. <coughs> One of the biggest problems that I had was how I handled the animation. For some reason, when I started this project, I thought it would be fine to just not use sprite sheets for my images. All my game is, is just a bunch of images layered onto one another. I thought, how much could this really hurt performance? Oh boy, was I wrong. To show you how horrible this really is, I need to first explain how the animation class works. Firstly, I call the constructor function, which takes in a few inputs. The seconds per frame, list of images, which is just a list of strings, a reference to the current image, if the animation would loop, and finally, a location vector. For some reason, I set up the animation class to not have a draw function. Instead, I asked for a reference image. I have no idea why I did this. It makes it so much more confusing. I was dumb. Then all the information would be saved in memory until I needed it. Then I would call the start function. Inside there was a timer. The timer is responsible for updating the animation. It's pretty simple. Inside the timer's update function are two variables, the timer and the max time. The timer variable is updated by adding the delta time every frame. Once the timer is greater than or equal to the max time variable, then the timer has completed. From here, it will call a callback function that I have set up back inside the animation class. The anim callback function is responsible for changing the image of the animation. It'll add one to the frame number variable and will loop back around to zero if it is greater than the max frame. Then using the frame num as an index, it'll find the specified value inside the anim list. With this value, it will then instantiate the image of the animation. This whole process was very unoptimized. There was no reason for me to have to load each image for only 0.1 second just to then change it out for another. Sure, this may work for a single small image, but doing this with an entire 1920 by 1920 map every tenth of a second along with every other object being animated was a little much to handle. It's not like we're living in the 1970s where I only have 4 kilobytes of RAM. And most modern computers have around 4 to 16 gigabytes. Which is kind of crazy to think about because uh, just the map alone is 270 kilobytes. So I had to think of a better way to do this. I pretty much had to remake my entire animation class. The first major change I made was using sprite sheets. Instead of having many different images that would have to load in one by one, why wouldn't I just load them all in together? So this is what the character sprite sheet looks like. It's organized based off the walking animation at the top, then the idle, and then finally the fishing. But how does this work? It would be pretty weird to have the character look like this while playing the game. This is where the SDL library has something pretty useful called the source rect. When drawing an image, the SDL render copy has a few different parameters. The renderer so it knows what viewport to render to, the texture or image it's supposed to draw, the source rect, and the destination rect. Recs contain a location and size to them. The destination rect is where the image is and how big it should be. But the source rect is what we need. This is essentially a small window that can change its size and location. This then crops the image to what we need. So if we do this with the sprite sheet, we're able to crop the image to only display one character at a time. Perfect. But now he doesn't move. We now have to figure out how to get the source rect to move around. This is relatively simple. Remember when I said the old animation class would change the image? Well, instead of changing the image based on the frame, we now change the source rect. This can be done by multiplying the frame num times the cell size of the animation. Okay, this looks pretty- Oh, that's definitely not correct. Oh yeah, the character sprite sheet isn't a single line, and it has multiple animations in each of those lines. So I kinda need a way to tell the program what animation to use, and where the animation starts and ends. So firstly, I change the constructor function. Its parameters include a path of the sprite sheet, a cell width and height, an unordered map of animation data, which I'll come back to in a second, if the animation should use world or screen location, and finally, the location of the animation. 
so what is this? Well, it's a dictionary that contains a name key and an animation data struct. Then, when creating the animation object, it would look like this. An unordered map variable would be defined, then values would be added to it. For objects that have multiple animations, like the character, there will need to be many inserts called. Each insert will contain a name of the animation, the start position, which goes off the cells, not the pixels. So this is position 00, this is position 01, and this is position 187. Then an end position, duration, and if the animation should loop. Then this information is given to the animation object. After the animation object is set up, we can now set the animation with this function. This is why I use an unordered map so I can quickly find the animation to use based on its name instead of an index. Then we run the start function to actually get the animation going. Now instead of using a dumb reference, my animation class now has its own draw function. So now everything's a little more tied together and less confusing to debug. The second optimization is to keep the images in memory. Since most computers have more than 4 kilobytes of RAM, this can be done pretty easily. The animation class will only keep stuff in memory that it needs. For example, stuff with other worlds won't be included until that world is loaded, then the world that the player just left will unload all of their images. But all of my images right now are only 8.5 megabytes, so this really shouldn't be a problem. Keeping images in memory is pretty simple. This was pretty much done in the sprite sheet optimization, but all I need to do is make the sprite sheet variable inside the header file, then don't delete it until the animation object is deleted. Now, instead of loading images every time the animation changes, we load it once at startup or when loading a different world. The final optimization that I have done is changing any animation class that uses many of the same sprite sheets, so pretty much just the trees. Previously, each tree would load its own image, but the trees all use the same sprite sheet, so why would I need to load each image for each tree if they could just share one? The tree and leaf sheets add up to about 17 kilobytes of information, so loading this 35 times would mean that I have around 600 kilobytes of more information than I need. Although this really isn't much, I don't think I should just leave it. So instead, I have it only load the tree sprite sheet once using a static variable. Then for the rest of the trees, I pass in the image instead of having to load another one. Feels so nice to move more optimizedly. I can move so fast. Woo, it feels good. You know what else will feel good? If you watch this video. Okay, I go run now. Whee!